exciting story about American veterans as told by the veterans themselves and hosted by Randy Baxter, the host of The Veteran Next Door. The Veteran Next Door. Here's your host, Randall Baxter. You listen to the Veteran Next Door, and I'm your host, Randy Baxter. On the morning of April 6, 1862, 40,000 Confederate soldiers under the command of General Albert Sidney Johnston poured out of the nearby woods and struck a line of Union soldiers occupying ground near Pittsburgh Landing on the Tennessee River. The overpowering Confederate offensive drove the unprepared Federal forces from their camps and threatened to overwhelm Ulysses S. Grant's entire command. Some Federals made determined stands, and by afternoon they had established a battle line at the sunken road known as the Hornet's Nest. Repeated rebel attacks failed to carry the Hornet's Nest, but massed artillery helped to turn the tide as Confederates surrounded the Union troops and captured, killed, or wounded most. During the first day's attacks, General Johnston was mortally wounded and was replaced by PGT Beauregard. Fighting continued until after dark, but the Federals held. By the next morning, the reinforced Federal Army numbered about 40,000, outnumbering Beauregard's Confederate Army of less than 30,000. Grant's April 7th counteroffensive overpowered the weakened Confederate forces, and Beauregard's Army retired from the field. The two-day Battle of Shiloh produced more than 23,000 casualties and was the bloodiest battle of, in American history at the time. One of those deaths was the grandfather of General Robert Reese Nayland, but it's pronounced Neyland, the Confederate soldier, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Reese Neyland. He had a three-year-old son that soldier's son became a lawyer in Texas. Some years later, in 1891, the University of Tennessee fielded its first competitive football team. 30 years after that Civil War battle in 1892, on a Wednesday morning, February 17, Robert Reese Nealon was born. Benjamin Harrison was president. He was a Republican. He would lose the presidential election to Grover Cleveland. The main issue was the stability of the dollar. Sounds like what's going on now. Ellis Island began processing immigrants. The first official basketball game was played. The very first version of the Pledge of Allegiance was said. The Battle of Wounded Knee was two years old, and there were 44 states in the Union. The Panama Canal had not been built. The Tsars and the Kaisers were in power in Europe. America was in the Industrial Revolution and the General Electric Corporation had just been formed. You know, these are all things that were going on at the time of General Robert Reese Neyland's birth. And we're gonna talk about how that affected his life and how his life affected our lives in the next segment of this show. You're listening to The Veteran Next Door. I'm your host, Randy Baxter, and we'll be right back. Veteran Next Door will return in a moment. Welcome back. You're listening to Veteran Next Door. I'm your host, Randy Baxter, and we're talking about General Robert Reese Nealon, football coach, University of Tennessee. How'd he get there? Well, 
he talked about his childhood a little bit already, but when he got out, got out of high school, at the time uh, Theodore Roosevelt was president, but he went, he entered a little junior college, Burleson Junior College in Greenville, Texas, which is a, a little bit northeast of um, Dallas. But a year later, he transferred to another school that we're going to know well here one day called Texas A&M where he studied engineering and played baseball and football. And in 1912, Robert Reese Neyland won a competitive appointment to West Point where he continued his engineering studies and his athletic development. He played end on the 1914 and 1950 Army football teams. But not only did he play football, he played baseball where his team won 20 straight games in baseball, defeating Navy four times. And then in his spare time, he won the heavyweight boxing title three years in a row at West Point. So he grew up in East Texas, and his first brush with local fame came as a semi-pro baseball player while in high school. But upon graduation from West Point, Neyland served with distinction in France in World War I. But before that, he was on the Mexican border, some say against Pancho Villa. But in actuality, what, what he was doing was he was building levees and building roads because he was an engineer. But he also wound up in Asia during World War II, rising to the rank of Brigadier General and he was highly decorated by several governments for his work coordinating supplies to war-ravaged, isolated China. So after, after his time in, in, in Mexico and along the Mexican border when he went to World War I, before the war ended, he was assigned to Fort Bliss, Texas. And that's where the American Expeditionary Forces uh, in 1917, 1918, under John Pershing, transferred uh, to Fort Bliss, where they were responsible for the organization, training, and supply of an inexperienced force that eventually grew from 27,000 men to 2 million men, the National Army of World War I. So when the United States entered the war in April of 1917, there were only 3,000 enlisted engineers. Robert Reese Neyland was one of them. But by the end of the war in November 1918, the demand for their expertise had required the services of almost 400,000 engineers. They were in charge of repairing the devastation of World War I to expedite troop movements such as surveying, bridge and road repair, constructing buildings, maintaining communication lines, removal of landmines and booby traps, digging trenches and constructing shell, gas and splinter proof shelters, providing clean water and constructing or removing barbed wire. They also launched gas attacks, built hospitals, barracks, mess halls, stables, target ranges and repaired miles of train tracks. Their extensive and time-consuming duties left them little time for rifle practice and drills, and they were not relied upon for front-line combat, but the success of the Allied forces depended upon the support of the Engineer Corps. So, Lieutenant Robert Reese Nealon had, had uh, gone to college and learned to become an engineer, had, had some of the experience of the troubles that we were having on the Mexican border, and served in World War I. When the war was over, in 1920, he took additional coursework in engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, before returning to West Point in 1921 as an assistant adjutant and assistant coach in football, baseball, and basketball. He also served as an aide-de-camp to Academy Superintendent General Douglas MacArthur. One other thing while he was playing baseball at West Point, the uh, pitcher on the team hurt himself and couldn't pitch anymore. So the coach pulled them together and said, boys, we got to make some adjustments here. And he called General, no, he wasn't General then, he called Robert Reese Neyland up and said, Neyland, you're the pitcher now. Give your first baseman mitt 
to this guy over here. Jeremy Nealon took his first baseman mitt and put the pitcher's glove on and threw his first baseman's mitt over to a man named Omar Bradley. In 1926, Captain Nealon was assigned to the University of Tennessee as ROTC commandant and also served as assistant to the district engineer of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Chattanooga. In 1931, Neelan became district superintendent and supervised the dredging of the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers, and he also oversaw the preliminary surveys for Norse Dam, which was built later by the Tennessee Valley Authority. I bet you didn't know all that about General Robert Reese Neelan. In 1926, Neelan became the head football coach of the University of Tennessee. That was after the current head coach at the University of Tennessee decided to take the job at Knoxville Central High School. In the period from 1926 to 1934, Neelan's teams won 75 games, lost seven, and tied five. They lost only one game out of the 68 played on their home field. He was a firm disciplinarian. Neelan stressed speed and conditioning. He required that players rehearse plays until they could execute them perfectly. To Neelan, the most important game of the season was the one against Vanderbilt. In 1927, Tennessee played Vanderbilt to a 7-7 tie in Knoxville. Thereafter, the Volunteers lost only three times to Vanderbilt in 19 games. You know, as a kid, I never understood the rivalry between Tennessee and Vanderbilt. I just thought we were always going to beat them. I didn't understand that that part of General Neyland's job when he was hired was to end the dominance of the Vanderbilt football team over the University of Tennessee. And he did a pretty good job at that until 1935. In 1935, the Army sent Robert Reese Neyland to the Panama Canal. I couldn't find out what he did there. I, I, I tried to do the research. Maybe somebody out there knows. I'd like to know. The only thing I can think of uh, on his tour of duty at the same time was that industries across the world were starting to build ships like the Queen Mary that were too big to get through the Panama Canal. Maybe they, they sent him down there to work on it. I don't know. But when the Volunteers lost all their major games that season, the fans demanded his return. So not only are our fans today kind of demanding, the fans back then were already spoiled rotten. They didn't know about losing football games, and they demanded that he be brought back. Neyland had found that he'd also missed football coaching more than he expected. So in 1936, he had to make a choice, stay in the Army or go coach football. So he retired from the Army and returned to Tennessee as head football coach. During his second round of coaching, Neyland coached George Cafago, Babe Wood, Sam Bartholomew, Jim Wright, Bowden Wyatt, Lynn Kaufman. UT won 11 games in 1938, 10 in 1939, 10 in 1940. Neyland's defense limited the opposition to 42 points in 50 games. No wonder we're not happy when we lose a ball game. Our granddaddies told us all about what was going on. And they raised us to think that we were supposed to win and not lose. But when the U.S. entered World War II, Neyland was called back into the service and assigned to Norfolk as a district engineer. He was reassigned to Dallas before being sent to China and then Calcutta, India, where he served as port commander. At the time, China had been cut off by the Japanese military from supplies. The only way we could get supplies to him was flying over a big mountain we called the Hump. But during that time, he rose 
to the rank of Brigadier General. Neyland was awarded the Legion of Merit with two clusters and the Distinguished Service Medal from the United States, the Chinese Cloud and Banner, and the British Knight Commander. When the war was over, in 1946, Neyland returned to coaching at the University of Tennessee. His 1946 team won the Southeastern Conference Championship, and the 1950 team made a postseason trip to the Cotton Bowl, ending the season with a 10-1 record. The next year, the Volunteers became the National Collegiate Champions. By 1952, Neyland, now General Neyland, Brigadier General Robert Reese Neyland, was in poor health. He retired from coaching in 1954, but continued as an athletic director. He was the first coach in the South to use press box spotters and the telephone to assist him in making coaching decisions. He, you veterans that are coming home, he's a prime example of using your skills you learned in the military to come and get a job. But all of a sudden, the, the other coaches that were out there were outmatched because, he, because of his ability to see uh, that if you acted like maybe a military uh, leader on the field, that you could conquer the other team. He produced nine undefeated teams, 40 all-conference stars, 21 All-Americans, five Southeastern Conference championships, and one national championship. He was elected to the Football Hall of Fame in 1953 and named the Football Writers Man of the Year in 54 and received the A.A. Stagg Award by the American Football Coaches Association in 1957. Every time I drive down Nayland Drive and look over at that football stadium, I expect to see it there. I hardly ever think about the fact that, that it used to just be a football field and that, that every time our engineers in today's world pull out the plans to make improvements on that stadium, they're pulling out the plans that General Robert Reese Nealon had set aside for them to make the stadium grow. You're listening to The Veteran Next Door. I'm your host, Randy Baxter, and we'll be right back. The Veteran Next Door will return in a moment. Welcome back to The Veteran Next Door. I'm your host, Randy Baxter. You know, we've been talking about Brigadier General Robert Reese Neyland and, and uh, how his life led, led him to the University of Tennessee. But uh, we, one more thing that we want to talk about during World War II when he was stationed in Calcutta, India. And he was, when I was a kid, I watched movies like Merrill's Marauders and heard about General Stilwell and things like that. I never thought about uh, they were getting their supplies shipped to them from uh, Calcutta and that maybe General Needland had a lot to do with arming them and getting their equipment to them and their food to them. While he was in Calcutta, he was in charge of, of a lot of American troops there. And, and these American soldiers were coming in, you know, eating hamburgers and, and uh, living a different life, and, and he just wrote them a letter. And this is what he said to them. This, he's speaking to the American troops. Once I knew a man who grew up in Philadelphia but never visited Independence Hall, located there. I know several New Yorkers who, though they live in its shadow, have never visited the Statue of Liberty. I hope it can never be said that you were in Calcutta and didn't visit the Burning Ghats, the Caligat Temple, and some of the other equally famous sites which Calcutta affords. If you come here with an open mind, you will find Calcutta is Tikha, which means okay. Of course, it's just like visiting any big city back home. You can have a good time or a bad time, depending on how well you take care of yourself. Incidentally, the people here like us. They think we're all right. Thanks to the good behavior of the American soldiers who preceded you, a friendly welcome from these folks awaits you. If you behave equally as well, a similar welcome will wait your buddies who follow you here. TK, Brigadier General Robert Reese Nalen, Calcutta, 1945. And you know, I had mentioned to you earlier that he was a strict disciplinarian, but he also had a nice Southern way of saying, uh, be nice and 
take care of yourself. But but they knew he was a strict disciplinarian. So anyway, my guest today is Russell Smith from The Drive, uh, WKVL's afternoon talk sports show. I, I wanted to uh, bring Russell in because I know he knows a lot more about football than I do. Russ, welcome to the show. Uh, let's not be too sure about that, Randy. <laughs> but, hey, you listen to the show, as some people say, I don't know what I'm talking about, but... <laughs> Thanks well, for having me. Well, give me your general opinion of, of you know, you, you've, you've met coaches. Um, you've talked to coaches. Not that, I don't know if you ever met General Nealon or not. But no, what, you'd be a little bit before my time. Okay. So what's your gen- general opinion of the legacy of General Nealon, or what do, you, what do you know or what do you think? Uh, his legacy is incredible. I mean, uh, the stat I, I love to throw out there, one of my favorite Tennessee-related stats in, in uh, all of college football is – the fact that since 1926, when the general took over the uh, Tennessee football program, Tennessee has won more college football games than any school in Division One. They've won more games in Alabama, more games in Michigan, Notre Dame, USC, all those great programs that people think of when they think of you know the greatest teams ever. Tennessee's won more games since 1926, and that's all due to the general. Well, we're spoiled, aren't we? Absolutely. And think of, you know, some of the certainly recently Tennessee has had some bad seasons. They've had, you know, bad seasons before, but they've still won more games than all those other storied programs. And, uh, you know, the general's tenure there uh, is is just unmatched when you look at uh, the winning percentage. I think he won 80 one percent of his games which is uh by far the record for coaches who've coached at least uh i think 10 10 years or so wow well um i know we, we've got lots of facts laying around here i was showing you one paragraph there that that sure. uh, could you read that yeah. and tell me what your opinion of that is neeland's teams owned much of their success to defense he once explained that an offense can score only three ways while the defense can score in four ways on an interception a fumble a blocked kick or a kick return, he added, quote, the psychological shock of being scored on in any of those ways is so profound that a team so scored on rarely is able to rally for victory. He talked about psychological shock, and then and then we know when, I'm, when we hear military stories about shock and awe, and, mm-hmm. and he's talking about knocking them down emotionally and psychologically in the game and it, on top of physically. Yeah. So well, think, uh, How many times have you been sitting there watching a football game and you see – you know, a close game, and all of a sudden there's a interception return for a touchdown or a blocked kick that's that's run back for a score or something like that, and that just kind of can change the entire complexion of a game at the drop of a dime. And a lot of people don't realize that. I think it's interesting that he he talks about a blocked kick or a kick return as you know a defensive score a lot of people look at that as special teams kind of a third object but he's you know ever the military man defensive uh strategy thinking and uh, he looks at that as a way to score on defense as well do you think the other football coaches realized that they were going up against a real live general <laughs> um probably there towards the end when his reputation was uh what it was but yeah, I think you know he was the first to to bring spying in. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, he's changed the definition of a quarterback. Yeah, he um, was the first to to use game film to scout uh, other other opponents. He was the first to use film to film his own practices to look at his own team and and use pictures to and, and, to point things out and radio communication. He was the first to have. You always see on the nowadays it's commonplace. You'll see the quarterback come over and pick up the telephone and talk to the coach upstairs. He was the first one to install a phone. I mean, think of what an innovation that must have been in the 30s or whenever it was that it, what he did. That people must have said, why, why do they have a phone on the sideline? You Look know, at this guy's on yeah. the phone. Yeah, I'm who's not. he talking to? Is he ordering pizza over there <laughs> so, or something? So all of a sudden, if maybe a Vanderbilt coach or somebody look over there and they would you know realize that this guy knew how fast they were, knew what their strengths were, knew what their weaknesses were he had people up in the stands looking and seeing what they were doing right and wrong and radioing it in he also had uh, he was the first uh, coach to use weather reports to really plan his practices and he had a guy in memphis who would uh, call him on monday and keep in mind you know think of how inaccurate weather reports are nowadays i mean this is back in uh in uh, the 30s in the black and white days and he'd have guys give him the forecast and if he thought it was going to rain well he'd practice with uh, wet footballs all week and everything to, to get ready which is you know just leaving no detail left to chance russ um 
I'm a history major, not a sports person, but there were, a long time ago there was a general called Sun Tzu. And the art of war. Yeah, the art of war. And Sun Tzu talked about all these things about what you do in battle. Mm-hmm. But General Nalen had some maxims. Um, that seven seven rules that uh, I think there were seven maxims yep. that he liked. Uh, can you review some of those with us? And do you, do you think the t- football players use that today? Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I was looking at uh, some things online of uh, you know the big trend in college football now is to have these big fancy practice facilities, locker rooms, and all this. And I was looking at Ole Miss, and they've got a brand new locker room, and they've got uh, these rules of football. On, written on the wall of their locker room, and it's, it's the maxims. They've, they've distilled it down to, I think, five, but it's the same language uh, that you see from General Neyland's maxims, which Tennessee still reads for verbatim, all seven of them today. What, what are they? Let's, let's go over them. Uh, the maxims are the team that makes the fewest mistakes will win. Play for and make the breaks, and when one comes your way, score. If at first the game or the breaks go against you, don't let up, put on more steam. Protect our kickers, our quarterback, our lead, and our ball game. Ball, Oski, cover, block, cut, and slice. Pursue and gang tackle, for this is the winning edge. Press the kicking game. Here is where the breaks are made. And finally, carry the fight to our opponent and keep it there for 60 minutes. What is an Oski? Oski is, um, that's a good question. There's actually a, a sports bar out in West Knoxville named Oski's, and people always ask about that. That's, uh, as I understand it, it is when an interception or a fumble is recovered by the defense, that's what the, uh, uh, the defense yells to alert the rest of their teammates that there's been a change of possession. We have the ball now. Instead of trying to tackle the other team, we're trying to block so that we can go score. Oh, I didn't know that. Lots okay. of people don't know that. <laughs> okay, but but I don't think people use that exact terminology anymore. But some well, some teams do. A lot of times it might be some profanity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? But anyway, so Noski, uh, and and does the University of Tennessee use that on the field? I don't know if uh, they use Oski uh, right now, but I'm I'm sure there's there's some sort of alert that uh, the players yell to let all their teammates know, and it, it very well may be Oski. Okay, that's interesting. So, so you've talked to other coaches. Uh, do you think the other coaches follow that, or, or do they teach that? Or lots of coaches do. I know Philip Fulmer and, and Johnny Majors. The players recited all seven maxims before every game, and is really the cornerstone of what Tennessee football is all about. I think, uh, I think they still read it the one year Lane Kiffin was here, but I don't think he. Uh, put the, quite the emphasis on it that Coach Fulmer and the previous Tennessee coaches did, which was the subject of some consternation for a lot of fans. Derek Dooley really brought it back and, and embraced the maxims. And I don't, I haven't talked to Butch Jones about it yet, but I would venture to guess that the maxims will be a big part of uh, Tennessee football under Coach Jones, just knowing the way he embraces Tennessee's traditions. Mm-hmm. You're listening to The Veteran Next Door. I'm your host, Randall Baxter. I'm going to guest Russell Smith from The Drive, and we'll be right back. The veteran next door will return in a moment. Welcome back to the veteran next door. I'm your host, Randy Baxter, and I have a guest host today, Russell Smith from The Drive on WKVL. Uh, Russell, I found a list of 50 facts um, about General Neyland that, that I'd like to talk to us a little bit about, and I found found several uh maybe we just go through the list a bit sure. here but but one of them says that general neyland preached readiness maintaining that almost all close games are lost by the losers not won by the winners did you think that was true in the past couple of years here uh i think that's true in sports in general yeah i mean um you know, and I, I go back to 1998 when Tennessee won their national championship under Coach Fulmer and T. Martin was the quarterback. And I remember all during that fall camp before that season, everybody thought, well, Tennessee's not going to be as good this year because Peyton Manning's gone and all this. And, you know, the, the big thing with T. Martin was they just didn't want him to lose the game. I remember Coach Fulmer and Coach Cutcliffe saying that, well, we just don't want him to throw interceptions. It, he doesn't have to make this spectacular play. Just don't make the mistakes that get you beat. And I remember at the time thinking, boy, what a defeatist attitude that is. Well, it worked. They won every game and won a national championship. So it shows the value of playing conservatively. Yeah. I remember a couple of years ago, what was it, LSU, and we were about to score a touchdown or something. What, do you remember that or – 
we had too many men on the field. Oh and, yeah, and and we lost that game. Exactly. Yeah, the Dooley's uh, had a chance to win, beat LSU down there, a good LSU team, and had them stopped on the goal line and had 13 men on the field. And LSU got a second chance and scored and won oh, the that's game. That's what it was. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. But did you see anything on this list that you want to talk about? Yeah, I see one here. Uh, Nealon came to UT as a U.S. Army captain on September 20th, 1926, six days before his first game as a college head coach. Nealon was promo- promoted to the grade of major in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. You know, he was uh, – uh, just came as a, running the ROTC program in, mm-hmm. in, in the 1920s and wasn't a general at the time. And, you know, he's it's amazing to think that, you know, nowadays a coach wouldn't have time to have a military career and a, a coach a football program simultaneously, but he was able to do both and succeed uh, greatly at and, both. And his salary here at the time was equivalent to our salaries of about $9,000. Oh, wow today's money unbelievable yeah so yeah okay well and and he also at the same time was working with the tva not the tva system but but dredging the rivers and and you know he was an army engineer you know uh, the i would highly recommend if you can find it uh, bob gilbert wrote a biography about general neeland and um I, i believe it's called the gridiron general and in that biography, there are actual, he's got the diagrams of some of Neyland's plays that he drew up. And they're very, it's remarkable how everything is symmetrical and it looks like an engineer's drawing. As you see coaches today, they draw on the whiteboard and it's all sloppy. And everything of Neyland's diagrams are so precise. You have a feeling that if you got broke out the, the ruler and measured it, it'd be uh, symmetrical within you know, a centimeter. And he had him execute those plays the same way. Oh, absolutely. So he had the timing Precision. down. And, yes. Okay. Well, uh, and, and from 1938 to 1940, his teams recorded an amazing 17 consecutive regular season shutouts. It's, yeah, that is to me one of the more unbelievable streaks of any era in college football. And I remember when I was a little kid at first hearing about it and just not. It, it kind of boggles the mind that 1939 team went through the entire season unscored upon. Yeah. <laughs> Not just undefeated, unscored upon. They shut out every single regular season opponent. Didn't allow a point. I mean, that's uh, unfathomable today. So so those those teams walked on the field, and, and I know the, the team was good, but the coaching had to, you know, they had to be saying, don't let them do this, don't let them do that, yeah. and, and they won't score. Uh, no, just the, the defensive mindset of Neyland, you know, back in those days, uh, you know, the punt was such a weapon. It was a, a field position game, and he would put, pin you on your side of the field, and you were lucky to cross midfield at, at some point. And and didn't he coach uh, Cafigo? Was it yeah, Cafigo, it, Cafigo was on those teams, the 38 to 40, uh, George Bad News Cafigo, who went on to – coach special teams at Tennessee for so long punning yeah yeah wow uh also uh one of these facts was uh before Neyland 10 head football coaches had been hired and fired at Tennessee between 1900 and 1925 so well you think they've had some instability here <laughs> recently <laughs> 10 coaches in 25 years um, their principal failing being the inability to field teams that could beat Vanderbilt. You remember when Philip Fulmer got the job in Tennessee, just couldn't beat Alabama, and that was Major's big downfall. And uh, basically, he was hired with the directive to beat Alabama. A lot of fans uh, who aren't aware of Vanderbilt's history would probably be shocked to learn that the Neal- that the general or Neeland uh, before he was general was hired uh, in the mid twenties with the directive to beat Vanderbilt. That was right. the big rivalry game. Wow. At one time, and you talk, you talk about uh, Jeremy Nealon being a good coach, but he must have been a good teacher. At one time, more than 175 former Nealon players were active head coaches in the United States and Canada. Wow. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you talk about coaching trees and, you know, the Bill Walsh coaching tree, all the great coaches who coached under him are still coaching the NFL today. Um, Nealon had that too. And, uh, you know, his successor is Harvey Robinson – and then uh, Bowden Wyatt after that, who played for uh, Neyland as well. And, and uh, Murray Wormuth uh, coached at Minnesota for a long time, played for the general. No, I, Johnny Majors didn't play for the general. He played for uh, Bowden Wyatt later. But I, I still think you probably put him in the Neyland tree. Right. And then the same thing's happening to Pathead Summit. 
Oh, yeah. You know, her players are going out and coaching. And yeah, you got uh, Holly Warlick, uh, yeah. Nikki Caldwell, Kelly Jolly Harper, lots of them. Russell, you, you take so many more phone calls about sports. Do you think your listeners know these things about the general? No, probably not. I think they're vaguely aware of the fact that Neyland Stadium is named after uh, a general who coached football uh, a long time ago, but I don't think they, they truly understand the, the history and the man and uh, some of these neat things that we're discussing. It, it's a shame. I wish they, they ought to have a class over there that, you know, required to take if you want to graduate from the university. Do you, I probably shouldn't even ask this question. Do you think that's maybe why they, they maybe some of the listeners uh, uh, that don't even understand why they hate to lose so bad, or is it just the the general culture here? You know, well, I, Tennessee loss can affect people for forty eight hours or, oh, or seventy two hours, and I think uh, and we've heard uh, from preachers around here who says you you can tell whether they won or lost by looking at the offering plate on Sunday morning, <laughs> but. Uh, no, I think that we're spoiled here in East Tennessee, and it's ingrained in the culture. We have been since the 1930s when General Neyland was winning all those games. Okay. You know, th you think about some of the people that General Neyland associated with, and he played baseball with Omar Bradley. He served under General MacArthur. He knew General Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. General Eisenhower... They weren't real good friends, but when General Eisenhower was running for president, we came to Knoxville. He made sure that everybody knew that he was a friend of General. Oh Lee. yeah, so ever the politician. Uh, yeah, he, he had uh, a lot of neat contemporaries, and I always uh, like to throw out a, another stat. You know, as good as Bear Bryant was, most people would probably say that Bear Bryant's the best college football coach ever lived. But uh, even the Bear never beat the General, never defeated a Neyland coach team, and was said to have muttered at Neyland's retirement banquet, "Quote." Thank God the old guy finally quit. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, Russ, appreciate you coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, is, there, is there anything you want to add to this? I mean, you know, uh, hopefully your callers, uh, your callers when they call in will, will want to know these things. Or, um, But do, do you have any advice for maybe Coach Jones? Uh, <laughs> uh, Coach Jones probably d doesn't need my advice. I'm sure he's got access to a wealth of material on Neyland, but I mentioned Bob Gilbert's book. Uh, there's a lot of stuff online, as you found, available about uh, the general. And uh, I, I would just invite folks to go and, and read up and, and know your history. And it certainly uh, makes it the, the experience of going to a game at Neyland Stadium a little bit more meaningful and a little bit deeper. And, and when they talk about Tennessee tradition, they're not talking about just Johnny Majors. No. Or, it goes a lo whole lot deeper than that. Oh, yeah. It's, it's 120 years old. Yeah, there have been some great coaches yeah. come through here even before recent years. You're listening to The Veteran Next Door. I'm your host, Randy Baxter, and we're here with Russell Smith on The Drive, and we'll be right back. The Veteran Next Door will return in a moment. General Robert Reese Nalen, University of Tennessee football coach, produced 22 All-Americans and 40 All-SEC players. He was the first to coach in four major bowls, the Orange, the Rolls, the Sugar, and the Cotton. He holds the NCAA records for consecutive shutouts, 17, and consecutive shutout quarters, 71. He lost only one home game in 21 years, never coached a losing season, never had a losing record to any team he faced more than once, never lost to Bear Bryant. He changed the quarterback position. He changed the balanced line, single wing offense. He changed the in-depth scouting and recruiting reports. He helped set up the statewide radio network, the Vol Network. He had press box spotters, just like a military observation in a battle. He had sideline telephone use, just like in another, but any battle. He had, he went to low cut shoes, I don't know why he did that, but he went to lightweight pads and tear away jerseys and he said, hey, equipment's an important thing in this game. So, so you know, we need to really think when we complain about losing the game. We had a we had a coach who who taught us how to be perfect in the early part of the 20th century, and all of the coaches have had to follow the biggest shoes in in the NCAA sport. 
Hope you enjoyed our show today. Catch us on the call in Sunday morning. You're listening to Veteran Next Door. I'm your host, Randall Baxter, and we'll see you next week. You've been listening to Randall Baxter and the Veteran Next Door. 